Okay, hello everyone, good evening, and it's uh, very nice to see all of you again. Today I'm happy to show some interesting games uh, of my great countryman, Ulf Andersson. He was one of the world's best players in the 70s, in the 80s, and uh, apart from the fact that he was a very strong player, also he had a very special style, which uh, has impressed a lot of chess players all over the world, myself included. He was simply one of the best endgame players ever. And often in his games, he would look for a way to reach a favorable endgame already from the beginning of the game. And uh, he has stayed faithful to this style uh, during his whole chess career. So it's, it's a really interesting player. And uh, I remember reading, I think it was I don't remember which book it was, but they said, uh, Polugayevsky, I think, said that in the Soviet Union, we don't have a player like Ulf, they would say. There is not a player like, like him. He's a special case. So it will be interesting to look at these examples uh, today with, uh, with you. And uh, in the first place, many of you probably uh, attended that lecture about Tigran Petrosyan. And I will tell you very quickly that That's Ulf Andersson is one of the players who followed in Petrosian's footsteps, so to speak. He's another very strong player in prophylaxis, in uh, uh, positional, uh, how can we say, defensive strategy, the blockade and so on. So you will definitely recall some of Petrosian's ideas in the following examples. So let's uh, get started. Here is the first example, and uh, Ulf was, or well, is a very strong player in any tactical situation, and here we have a little example. Black played at this moment, you, we have a Sicilian structure, as you can see, white is playing some kind of dragon Sicilian with uh, reversed colors, and uh, the game is level at this point. However, Black uh, played a bad move here, he played bishop e6. And I want you to find out what's the problem with this move. So, two minutes, try to find a way in which Ulf won material with the white pieces. White to play and win material. Two minutes. Okay, guys. Well, I am muted in the Zoom call. Of course, Johan is teaching the US Chess School here, which is a group a very uh, talented, high-level students. Uh, but I'm here to hang out with Twitch chat. And uh, I'm gonna be solving these positions with you guys. So it's white to play. Um, last move was bishop e6. So let's see, what do we got here? Knight c5, bishop c7, e3, bishop b4, what are we doing? white to play and win material okay maybe knight c5 with the threat of bishop c7 it's kind of annoying Yeah, if we play e3 and chase the knight to b5, maybe we have some a4 ideas. Bishop c7, rook d7. We need a response there. Right. So maybe knight c5 with idea of e3 and a4. Um, or knight c5 with idea of bishop c7. I don't know, that's just my first guess. I wish I had more time. We're running out of time. Oh man. E3, knight b5, knight c5 there, also possible this move order. Okay, I think uh, time's up. We have three correct answers now. Some correct answers are coming up. Um, so, in the first place, 
congratulations to Arian Gutla, Troy Kavanaugh, and Alexander Wang. Uh, you got it right. Aha. Uh -huh. So, Arian, you were the first one. Please uh, share with us how should Wyatt continue here. Uh, so you start with E3, then 95, then 95. Basically, uh, you have threats of both A4 and 19B7. Uh -huh. And Bishop C7. So, so what's your next move, sorry? Knight C5 here. Exactly. Knight C5 at this point, forcing Black to do something about the B7 pawn, right? So if I play mm -hmm. here, Ariane, Bishop C8, what would happen? A4. Exactly. Now we play A4, I have to go to A7. Then bishop b6. And bishop b6. Unfortunately for black, the knight is trapped. Yeah. So in the game, black instead played rook e7, trying to defend the pawn that way. And uh, what do you think uh, white should play here, Arian? There are two good moves. You can just choose one of them. Bishop b4 looks tempting. a4 also. You're still thinking? Yeah, I didn't need to this uh, A4. Yeah, A4 is perfect. He didn't yeah, play. A4 the idea of A4. Bishop B4. Yeah, that that's perfectly fine, Arian. You can play A4. And Black would have to play Knight uh, A7, else he would, of course, lose the pawn on uh, on B7, right? And after Knight A7, your next move is easy to see, right? Bishop B4, Bishop B4 and it's obvious that Black will lose something here. In the game, actually, Anderson played. Bishop e4 immediately. But it comes up to the same thing because he's creating the threat of, of a4 and then taking the pawn, let's say, on b7 or on a6. No way that black can defend here. In the game, he tried rook f7 and yeah, white simply executed his idea. a4, knight a7, and knight takes b7. In this way, um, white won material. So it was very important to play, play out this... Uh, idea in this particular move order because if we go back here from the beginning uh, Orian said that we should play e3 and had we played in another move order had we played knight c5 first black would then play bishop c8 and uh, what would happen here Orian, if i play e e3 now uh, what's the difference the here there's difference knight e6 exactly now the knight can go back to e6 so that's why it's so important for us to play e3 from the very beginning forcing the knight to go to, to b5. And here again, you made a good choice, Orion, because if you play bishop b4 first, black had a little trick here. Uh, he would be able to play rook d8, d and after knight c5, he's not forced to protect the pawn on b7. He could play here the surprising move bishop f8. And in this way, uh, he creates a pin along this diagonal, and he would then save himself. Uh, interesting. So the only way to, to make this work is to start with e3, forcing the knight to go to the bad square on b5, and then play knight c5. In this way, we are preparing to play, like Orion explained, a4 next move. And unfortunately for black, the knight does not have any good squares. So, interesting, uh, interesting tactical idea. Uh, Ulf is very strong in this area. Uh, very strong in the Sicilian structure also that we are uh, what we are seeing here, uh, kind of reversed dragon. Okay, Arian is asking if I have Viking ancestor. I think uh, all Swedes, we are, uh, our ancestors are the Vikings. So I guess, yeah, well, the, my answer is affirmative. Let's uh, continue. Let's go to an end game, which is like we were saying, uh, one of Ulf Andersson's strongest areas. Oh, here we go. Okay. Should be good. I will explain this to you. You're playing here with the black pieces. Please don't get confused by the chaotic uh, pawn structure. The white pawns are going this way, right? And we have two pawns uh, on the E file. So these pawns are going that way, right? We're playing with the black pieces here. And black is very close to victory. And I want you to find the way in which Ulf Anderson won this endgame with the black pieces. Two minutes, black to play and win. Okay, first idea here is king f2, rook takes e5, 
If e2, rook f5, check. King g3, rook e5. Kind of we're repeating there. So king f2, rook takes e5. Maybe rook f7. But then king d1 stops the pawn. We have nothing better than just giving check. So maybe we go king f4. King f4, defending the pawn and threatening e2. King f4, rook f6 check, king e4. Kind of nice, <laughs> nice little shuffle. So what is white doing? King f4. If b7, you know, we just take this one. King d1. I feel like that second e pawn is going to be a really nasty shield for us. So I'm not too worried about that. Maybe even rook d7 check. Rook d5. Wow. Uh, please notice, guys, we're playing black here. So this square is f4, just in case. This is f4, it's not c5. c5 is uh, located over there. <laughs> Come on, guys. Coordinates are on the board, even. I mean, uh, there's no excuse. <laughs> f4. <laughs> okay. Rook d5, also interesting. b7, e2, queen, queen. I'm afraid so far nobody comes up with the right solution. Oh, this was wow. difficult. Wow. So that's, I guess it's not king f4. Yeah, of course. Chat, you're allowed to suggest moves. So rook d5 is interesting. b7, e2, queen, queen. Okay, but time's out. Gets Let's see how we check, can work right? this queen out. Queen b3 check. Uh, Almost everybody wants to play here king f4, but uh, I'm afraid this move won't work. If you play here king f4 in order to support, protect his pawn, and then try to, to run with the e pawn, I'm able to play here with white b7. In this way, I'm giving up my pawn so that the king can approach the enemy pawns. And I think that in this position, even without the pawn on g4, I would make a draw here. Because my king is coming to, to e2, next move, you cannot really prevent it, I can always give check, and uh, white uh, won't uh, lose this end. It's not not possible to, to lose here. Uh, I'd lose it. Some kind of, of field of... I'd lose uh, it, I'd find a way. Right? So, this is not gonna work for black. King f4, it's not the right uh, choice here, okay? so. Let me try again. I will give you one minute, okay? One minute. Uh, please check again Black's different options here. We can give Rook D2 check first, maybe. King moves and then rook d5, because then we're promoting with check. Rook d2, if king goes to the b file, then I'm not sure. Maybe rook d5 still. b7, check, and we take. Yeah, I like rook d2, rook d5. Rook d2, king c1, rook d5, b7, e2, white queens, then we queen with check. Okay, again, time's up. One move that we should notice here, a move which I think, uh, who said this move? Uh, Evan Han said this move. Rook d5. This is definitely a move that you should check here because it, it makes a lot of sense. You're preventing the black, uh, the white rook from taking the pawn, and now we're preparing to play e2. And I think this was perhaps the first move that Anderson checked in this position. Unfortunately, there is a surprise awaiting black here. White could now play b7. And if e2, both players will queen, but unfortunately, white has the first check, so he can play here queen b3, picking up the rook next move. So this is bad news for, for black, right? So if we go back again, 
this idea didn't work, but actually this is the right uh, idea. Just we have to change our move order. So the idea of rook d5 is correct. You gave me some other moves here. Please notice that if you play e2, I can take the pawn, and after, let's say, king f2, I could just use my king here. So I'm ready to give up the, oh, even the rook, and, and I will save myself in the end game with king and pawn. Mm, king, king is close enough. So this doesn't work for black either. Okay. Some people were saying the move king f2, and it's basically the same thing. I would just take the pawn. I could give, if I like, I, I can give a check here, but also I can simply move forward the king. And uh, again, it will be difficult for black to, to, to win this. I could give check here, for example, if I like, and give check again. It's not possible here for black to, to win this. Black doesn't even threaten so much here, so I think I could even play g5 here, could I? Um, so back to the to the beginning. The correct idea is to play rook d5, but not at this moment. So anybody, anybody understand it. now how to? I think we got it. How to win this end game? Kids gotta catch up, you know. Gotta learn their end games, but we got this one. <laughs> Look for an intermediate move, maybe. Okay, Jed Sloan, you found it. Uh, please, uh, Jed, uh, share with us. Let us know what what is the right way to go here. Okay, the right way to go is rook d2 and rook d5. So, um, uh -huh. so, after, so after the same line with um, after the same line with b7, you have um, you have um, rook b5 and rook b7, and then after king and after um. Ah, you're gonna take the pawn here. Interesting. I, I didn't even think about this. Oh, oh maybe. Okay. No, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Let's, just let me look here. I think I can save myself here, can, can't I? Because if you uh, protect the pawn, I can give check, right? And, okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe no. Maybe not. No. 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 Okay. Wait, but no, but okay. Let's let's uh, slow down and let let's look again. Go what back. What other move? Uh, Rook the eight. I mean, the first move that you should check here is is the most forcing move, right? Okay, yeah, E2. E2. But not, so, yeah, E2. So, it Wait. looks like the same variation that we already saw, but now please notice the difference here. What, what's the big difference yeah, here? Yeah, the, the pawn on E3, the pawn on, um, the king's on B3, so... Um, exactly. So, um, so he now, cannot give check anymore, right? Yeah. And then, so the, and, yeah, Black has... Yeah, black here... Has, like, definitely really good tactics here, but I can make a check. Of course. Uh, yeah. You can, you can see <laughs> that it, it's yeah. a funny position because... The both pawns, both the black pawn and the white pawns are instrumental in preventing the white checks. So he cannot give check to the black king here. And it's black who will have next uh, the next check here. So he can win in different uh, ways uh, just by, by giving check something like, I don't know, queen, queen e3 or, or perhaps queen v1, depending on what white plays, of course. So excellent work, uh, Jed. Very nice discovery. If we play the straightforward rook d5, well, White is able to queen, and this would, if we insist here with queening ourselves, this leads to complete failure after queen v3. So we have to throw in this intermediate check, rook d2 check. And no matter where the black white king goes, uh, he has problems here because obviously, if, if he steps on c3 or, or if he goes to the first rank, then the pawn will uh, queen the check, right? And this is the only way to win the game. Only by rook d2 we can win the game. Wolf Anderson, he was an expert in noting such little small details in the end game. Uh, one last thing about this game. Uh, here, if White really wanted to uh, keep on playing, he would have to play uh, King C4 here. Mm. This was the only way to, uh, to survive. Because here, well, Black would queen, but still White would have some at least practical chances here. I guess Black is winning, but still he would have to to work on this because the pawn is relatively uh, well advanced. Question from Nathaniel. What if king b2? Let's see. Rook, when, when king b2, Nathaniel? Uh, rook d2 check, king b3. I don't, uh, after the check, yeah, on c5. 
Uh, well, Nathaniel, I will unmute you so that you can explain uh, in a better way. Uh, please, go ahead, Nathaniel. At what moment? Well, uh, after the king was in check, instead of moving to c3 for b3. Yeah, I mean, if it goes to c3, uh, uh, like I was saying, I would play rook d5 anyway, right? And then I can check with uh, queen with check, right? So, where do you want to put the king? Yeah, I think it doesn't it doesn't work. No solution here. Black is winning, but very important to find this intermediate check on d2. Okay, let's uh, continue. We have a lot of things to look at today. We will now look at a more defensive situation. Uh, Ulf is playing with the black pieces. He's playing the Sicilian, which was mm. which is one of his favorite openings. Mm -hmm. uh, he plays it extremely well, and uh, here is black to play. I would simply like to know which is Black's best move. You don't have to win anything here, win material and so on. Just two minutes, send me Black's best move here. Interesting. Yeah, Ulf was like a Shevenigan expert. He had a lot of nice Sicilian wins. Okay, first instinct here is like <laughs> queen b8. I definitely don't want to take on e5 because fe5, I don't really see a good square for our knight. Queen b8 kind of holds the queen on this diagonal. And then our next move can be either bishop b7 uh, or maybe even knight d7. Maybe knight d7, yeah, but bishop b7 is what we really want to do. Especially queen b8, bishop f3, we need bishop b7 there. Um, we can also try queen a5, but yeah, the problem with queen a5 is white goes bishop f3 and we don't have a good a good spot for our rook. So this is this is looking more and more like a forced move. It's a very nice move, like backwards move, very aesthetic. I like it a lot. Yeah, I don't see what else we can do. Well, bishop d8, yeah, feels very passive. I don't know. I mean, I think um, we have some we have some big problems here to solve for black. So I'm sure there's. Okay, time's up. We had several correct answers here, and the fastest one was Daniel Asaria. So Daniel, share with us which is black's best move here. I thought the best move was queen v8, um, just because everywhere else the queen moves. Like for example, queen e5 just takes bishop f3, bishop a7 looks pretty, pretty bad. Exactly. We we lose the exchange, I think, here, and for no obvious compensation. Uh huh. So you're completely right, Daniel. Great work. Queen b8, backward move. If you remember our session about Petrosian, this should not be any surprise to you. Uh, this is like Daniel says, it's the only way that black can keep the position uh, in good shape. Uh, and actually, his problems are over. He's slightly better in this position already. If that? White now plays bishop f3, How about that? just like uh, Kirk Gasarian said, bishop b7 is excellent uh, reply, and Black has everything in order. We will come back to this game later on. Here it's an interesting tactical situation, but later on we will look at something more strategical uh, related to, to this game. So, only queen b8 works here. Any other move is uh, bad, uh, bad for Black. If we play bishop d8, for example, with the same idea. Again, uh, we will have troubles coming up. One way for white to play is bishop f3. And you can even play the fancy rook takes d8 here, and you would pick up Oof. material next move. So, very nice, queen b8. Oof. Please don't forget about those backward moves. They can be very useful. All right, so now we will change subject slightly. Oh boy. Interestingly, Anderson, just like Petrosian, he was uh, very good at relative value of the pieces, so to speak. 
uh, anti-materialist, uh, with other words. In this position, I want you to find the best way out for Black. Black is under some slight pressure here, and I would like to know how to continue with Black, how to get a playable position with the Black piece. So, two minutes, Black to play. Hmm. So the problem here is like black is under this heavy pressure. We have the rook on the d file, e5 pawn hitting d6. A lot of stuff is kind of a little loose. We can't really castle because bishop takes h6. Pawn is just hanging. So my first thought is to just trade off this knight, but after c takes d5, where is the knight going exactly? Knight d4, doesn't feel right. Knight g5 maybe, take, 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 bishop takes, uh, possibility, like take on d5, cd5, knight g5, take hg, queen takes g5, bishop takes e5, we hit h2 pawn, we hit b2, maybe, but bishop takes d5, actually white could also take with the rook, rook takes d5 might be stronger, just getting ready to take on d6 next move. Or rook h5 into that line? Yeah, yeah, maybe. But now I am thinking actually bishop d5, probably white takes with the rook. And if we go knight g5 there, e takes d6, doesn't look fun. Knight f3, g f3. I can go g5. But g5 to me feels kind of weakening. Like why we'll put the queen somewhere, like queen h3 and... Yeah. I'm not sure, I'm honestly just not sure. Oh, yeah, de5. Sorry guys. Okay. Yeah, de5. Time's up. Give the queen. D5, we had several nine, ideas eight. here. Some people <laughs> wanted to play g5, but I'm not so convinced by this move. Uh, I would play queen e4. For second, the queen. Please notice 100%. that weakening his king was never in Ulf Anderson's to his taste. Uh, in this case, okay, we can castle, I guess, short, but maybe some h4 coming up. Maybe we should rather avoid this, right? It looks yeah, a bit no good. No good. Uh, uncomfortable for black. There is a much better solution, and uh, Ryo Chen found this one very quickly. So, wow, Ryo, nice. please let us know <laughs> how to continue with black here. We are behind. The move is pawn takes e5, sacrificing the queen after knight f6. Four, uh -huh. four. And here I was debating should I attack capture with the bishop or the pawn? <laughs> Interesting. Like, for example, I, I wanted bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes. Yeah, that's how the game went, let me Queen tell you. G3? Looks great. Uh-huh. Black has solved all their problems. And then e4? Now you... Oh, interesting. He didn't play e4. Why didn't he play e4? Probably he didn't want to, why to play 95. 95? Is that so? Maybe some issue with taking the pawn on, on g6. Is that possible? Or maybe it's not possible. We would have rook g8 coming up. Uh, yeah. And I was also wondering if I took with the pawn, what would happen? Like pawn takes f6. Aha. Uh -huh. At what moment? Sorry? Oh, instead of bishop takes. No, I think it's okay to take with a uh, bishop. I think that in this position, uh, you would like to castle, but then, of course, you would drop the pawn on h6. So taking that into account, uh, what do you think black played? Hmm. Maybe knight f4? Knight uh, f4? Wow. Maybe, maybe. Wow, you're seeing a lot of interesting options here for black. I guess he didn't play that due to taking and queen takes and perhaps if bishop takes b2, you cannot take on b2, can you? Or maybe you can, because there is some trick on the first rank. Who knows? Maybe even this is possible for, for black, right? Uh, although some slight pressure for, for white here. Uh, well, in the game, he played something much simpler. He played simply h5, saving that pawn and also preparing to play h4 should white take on on e5 i mean it's it's not not a good idea anymore right to take due to 
H4. Mm, that's strong. So in the that's game, strong. White uh, simply play, replied with H for himself. And here, uh, I think the moment is right to cast two. And White took on E5. And what do you think is uh, Black's most active move here, Ryo? Ooh, have a knight g7. Which move do you like for Black? I like knight g7, knight f5. What do you think Ulf Anderson played here? Yeah, uh, Avan Chamadia found this move. Exactly. We should play actively here. Simply knight e4. Oh, knight. And in this way, Same thing. yeah, we are threatening the fork on e2 and also knight c2 perhaps. Uh, white took on d4, and after rook takes d4, actually black had a better game here, and he went on to win this game, because now you can see the bishop pair is rather strong, the rook is coming to d8, um, and even if white is uh, a pawn up, you could say, uh, you can feel that black is very active, and Ulf uh, was always excellent in this field, playing with a slight material disadvantage, we will see this later on in other examples. So, let's go back to here to the to the beginning, because we had some other suggestions here. Uh, Kirk Gasarian uh, suggests a move knight g5. That's a really uh, interesting move. I guess I would have to take on g5 and take with the queen. So, what what did you plan here, Kirk? What, what's rook h5? Okay, that's that's nice. No castling in this game. But we have a lot of uh, pressure on the center. Yeah, I think this, this looks nice as well. Uh, the queen will have to retreat and then we, we will take on e5 with the bishop, I guess. It looks playable to me as well, this variation. Uh -huh. Yeah, we will have to ask Ulf at some moment, why didn't he play knight g5? Anyway, I like the way that he continued in the game. It's a very straightforward way to play uh, d takes e5. No problem with giving up the queen because we get a lot of pieces in exchange for it. And uh, also this knight was very strong on d5, and now it's not on the board anymore. So I think it, this was a good solution. Uh -huh. Interesting. Let's uh, move on. And let's switch the board here. So we have some kind of, what should we call this Catalan English structure with mm. double fianchetto. Uh, one of Ulf's favorite setups. Uh, he would use this a lot over the years. Black has slightly misplayed this. As you can see, uh, white is much more active uh, with his rooks than the black rooks. So, actually, white has a very strong continuation here. There is one way say. in which white can get a clear advantage. <laughs> you here. don't say. And I want you to look for that oh, of course. Uh, way to clear advantage. No problem. White to play and achieve a clearly better position. Two minutes. Okay, guys, you heard the man. Hmm, can we get anything with e4? e4 feels unlikely because d just takes too many things on the diagonal. We don't really have time to take on d7. What about cd5, knight d5, rook d5? Take on c3, take on d7, right? Hold on, cd5, knight d5, rook takes d5, ed5. Exchange sack. Knight takes d5. Should be two. Queen b2 takes. Rook takes. Some compensation there for sure. It's hard to say if it's enough. So take. Knight takes d5. Knight d5. Bishop d5. Like this. Rook takes d5. Bishop takes b2. Rook d7. Also possible. Bishop goes back. Yeah, I'm with you. Cratic doesn't feel doesn't feel fully clear to me. No way I would just go for that in a game. I would I would want to think longer. I mean, white has like so many tempting options here. Like even like rook h4, <laughs> you know, this kind of move I would consider. But rook h4 against the fianchetto, I think, often doesn't work out. I'd be really surprised if that was it. What about e4, d4, knight e4? Is this possible? Bishop takes e4? No, it doesn't seem worth it. <laughs> bishop a3 I don't really like because we're stepping off this like insane diagonal you know with the dark sword bishop on g7 pointing it at our rook you know kind of inviting like some discovered attack I don't know of course black is going to see it and play like rook d8 there so <laughs> you could drop the rook back I mean I think that's definitely like 
uh, a reasonable idea here. So I guess this was a tough one and maybe two minutes is too little time to find the right solution. <laughs> but uh, I noticed that Austin Tang uh, made good progress here. So let's see Austin if we can yeah, looks like work this out this together. You're on uh, Austin. Well, I would play Austin. 65. Uh... Ah, it takes 65, sure. It makes sense to work on the open D file while white is clear control. Um, I would have to take with the knight, right? If I take with the pawn, this looks horrible for for black with his pawn on d5. Mm -hmm. I think one idea for white would be to play knight g5 here. Funny move, but I'm preparing to play knight f4, putting pressure on the d5 pawn. So let's continue here, uh, Austin. I'll play knight e5. Oh, uh, I'll play knight. Please continue. Aha, uh -huh. knight takes d5 and bishop d5. So far, everything looks normal. Some of you were saying to me here, rook takes d5. Okay, I understand the idea. It's certainly possible, but perhaps it's not so big deal after all, let's say. White takes and takes on d5. Maybe I can play knight f6 here. Uh, so this doesn't is nothing look that special. bad for black. But we have a much stronger option, right, Austin? Which of these bishops would you like to eliminate? Oh, e4. The bishop on d5 or the bishop on g7? Uh, you should try to eliminate the bishop on g7, so I would play e4. Exactly. Very nice. Very e4. nice. e4. That's the key move. And as you can see, black cannot really avoid this uh, exchange sacrifice because also, he has to think about the knight on d7. So he was forced to play here, bishop takes d4. How would you take back, Austin? You have uh, three options here to take back. There are th all of them look nice, but uh, one is better than the other. I like knight takes d4, because on bishop b7, you have knight takes e6, rook takes d7. So I would take with the knight. <laughs> OK, never mind. <laughs> we can take here in three different ways, but obviously, we are now playing for an attack, and since there is no bishop on g7, we should not forget about uh, the option of bringing our queen to h6 and playing knight g5. So for th this reason, I think it's best not to take with a knight. Oh. And I think the most forcing way to play here. Oh, well, some, some people are saying knight takes d4. Okay, interesting. And and uh, idea knight takes e6. Yeah. You're yeah. right, guys. Some I didn't people. think about this. Maybe yeah. this is also promising for, for white. And rook takes, I would have to play rook f7 can i survive here or or i'm just oh. dead lost well take take queen looks f3. interesting no you, you will have to take i guess mm -hmm. you can give check and try to bring the queen to f6 that looks nasty for black doesn't it yeah yeah i think i'm, I'm completely lost here so why why didn't he take with a knight on on d4 then what what might be the explanation uh, good question Let's see, something else here, rook e8. Does it make any difference? Or it's still very bad for for black? Maybe. It looks scary for black, I must say, with this bishop in command of the long diagonal. Yeah, maybe this was a good option as well, but I like what he played in the game. He played rook takes d4. Okay. Now bishop c6 is forced, and here a very strong move, queen d2. Queen d2. Yes. This way, we have the double threat of rook takes d7 and queen h6, and also, Queen c3 is coming up. So it's very difficult now for black to survive in this position. He tried in the game queen b7 here, Adorian with the black pieces. Ulf played rook d6, very clever move in this way. He's preparing to play queen c3. And I don't think there is any solution for black. He tried in the game e5, uh, blocking the bishop on b2. However, after queen c3, it was game over because if rook a c8, actually white can just uh, take on e5 anyway and not nothing that black can do here really if bishop takes e4 we have a very nice way of finishing off the game we could play here simply knight c6, oh, knight c6. <laughs> and it's going to be mate or black will lose a lot of wow, nice. Knight so, c6. That's uh, nice back to the beginning what we have seen here typical exchange sacrifice in the footsteps of tigran petrosian i would say c takes e5 white should act quickly before Black is able to bring some heavy piece to the d file. C takes d5, take on d5, and just like Austin said here, e4. Because when we sack the exchange, we want to eliminate that bishop, because that's the bishop which is protecting the king, right? And I think here, already, black is uh, beyond uh, salvation. Very nice attacking effort by Ulf Anderson. Let's continue. Here we're playing with the white pieces. 
And uh, let me tell you that one of the strongest generations in chess, I think it was uh, the players born in the year 1951, uh, the most prominent player of this generation, Anatoly Karpov. But also you have Wolf Anderson, you have his opponent in this wow. game, uh, Rafael Maganian. Wow. You have Jubojevic from uh, Yugoslavia. Jubojevic. Yeah. And uh, some other strong players. Jeez. This generation is really hard to, to beat, I think. Uh, 1990 is pretty good too. So here like Carlson, uh, we have and, like, so many players. a complex position. Black has weakened himself. Uh, back for pawn, weak square. But as you can see also, he has some plans of a grip on the dark squares. So at some point, he's probably trying to play here some knight d4. At some moment, he's going to play knight d4. Perhaps prepare it with a6 so that there is no... Oh, this one I've seen. This one I've seen. So I won't However, Wolf Anderson came up with a very surprising sol solution to this position. So you're playing white here. Two minutes, try to find a way in which white can achieve a clear advantage. Surprising way in which white achieves a clear positional advantage. And again, the hint is anti-materialism. Okay? Don't be too materialistic. Hi right, guys, white to play here. The question is how are we going to deal with this knight coming to d4? So we have to come up with a plan for white. And the theme is anti-materialism. So the rest is up to you guys. Knight d5 always comes to mind, for sure. Knight d5 does kind of hang the b2 pawn. So if, since b7 is defended, I would definitely consider just snapping on b2. And then pulling the bishop back. But the main thing is we have to deal with black's plan of knight d4. Knight d5, black can also play like rook e8, right? Knight b5, definitely a move here, hitting d6. Um, my guess is maybe black takes on b2. Then we move the rook, and then bishop e5 might be possible. f4, not so clear. So knight b5 is, is definitely something worth considering. Ah, knight b5, there might be a trick here. Knight b5, a6. Knight takes d6, bishop e5. And the knight is in trouble. Knight f5 we have, though, because knight on d7 is still hanging. Hmm. Tricky line. Okay, so time's up. This was a difficult one, I can see. I think only Austin Tang found the right idea. Uh, but before we get into this, let's check very quickly some options for white here. Knight b5, some people are saying, yeah, this is very logical, attacking the pawn on d6. I'm afraid that the only problem is bishop takes b2. And if rook d1, I guess black would somehow give back the material, material here. Bishop d4, maybe. Mm. So that, let's say, if we take, 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 we put the knight on somewhere, c5 perhaps. I'm not convinced that uh, white has a big advantage here. The knight is very strong on c5. Usually in the Maroxi structure, it cannot stay there due to b4, and here nobody can chase it away. So I think black is okay here. Another move that uh, some of you were suggesting was knight d5. Okay, I understand. This is a move that we will play later, but here, honestly, I'm not really convinced. I could maybe take the pawn and perhaps just go back. Yeah. So it doesn't mean look uh, constructive. Um, Okay, Austin, let us know your move here, your great plan with white pieces. Uh, I would play rook c2 with the idea nice. after knight d4, rook d2, and I can sack the exchange. Sure. Actually, if I play knight d4 here, I think now you can take on d4. Oh, the big yeah. difference being that now you have the pawn protected, so you're going to win a pawn here. I cannot defend myself properly. Obviously, bishop e5 would fail too f4. So, uh, also for that reason, knight, uh, ru sorry, rook c2 is a good move. Well, I would play here like in the game a6. That's what Vaganian played. 
So what, how would you continue, Austin? Uh, I would, I would still play Rook D2 here. Sure, of, of course. Now we play Rook D2 and uh, yeah, the pawn is in, in the air, so Black had to play Knight E4. And It'll now you already know what will happen, right? Yeah, Bishop takes D4 and... Exactly, Bishop takes D4, pawn takes D4. Take. And no worries here. Don't look too much at the material, look at the activity. Take it. Of course, we should just sack the exchange here. That's the whole idea. Take it. After bishop takes d4, queen takes d4. Yeah, actually, white has a game over. pleasant advantage here. It's, it's not easy for black to, to continue. Perhaps some people will say that, okay, this cannot be that bad for black. After all, it's just one pawn. But if we look more carefully, we can notice that, well, rook d1 is coming up. This pawn should be defended in some way. Black would love to put his knight on f6 so that the move 95 would be prevented. However, he cannot. It's not possible. So what to play with black here? I didn't find any good way to continue. Uh, one move that I looked at was knight e5. However, in this case, knight e5 looks very strong. And f4 is coming up with uh, active uh, play for white uh, threats against the black king. So it's, it's not easy for... Queen a7 says, Avan, you're right. Might be the best move here. And here, of course, I will not swap queens because I know that the black king is, is the more exposed one. I would play here queen c3. And then I would move away the king and play f4. Honestly, I, I don't like black's position here. He might be slightly ahead in material, but it's not an easy position to play, right? That knight is very strong on, on d5. And he's really missing that bishop that he had on, on g7. So, interesting concept by Ulf Anderson. He accepts a slight material disadvantage, but he now has very strong pressure. In the game, Crushing. Black simply opted for giving away that pawn. The Vaganian played queen a7, and then white just took the pawn. And uh, okay, Black is now better coordinated, but still, white is better here. This was a difficult position for, uh, for Black. He played here king g7, and uh, I think Ulf himself proposed queen c5 as the best option and go for this angle. But as you can see here, we already had two pawns for the exchange. And that's enough. That's good news for the endgame. So I guess we will uh, approach the king or perhaps e5 at some point is also interesting. In the long run, we also have a pawn majority on, on the queen's side. I would very much like to prefer, I would prefer very much to play with the white pieces here. So I think this was a very nice uh, concept. In the game, uh, King g7 was played and here white didn't swap queens anymore. Thanks to this precise move, black was not able to uh, bring his queen to, to, to this long diagonal and white got a very useful advantage. Knight f4, knight f4 nice move Oof. targeting e6. <laughs> it paid. White knight f4. went Rude. on to win here. Yeah, nice move, rook d4. <laughs> Flashy move. Queen c7. Breathe. I can't breathe. Big advantage for white and he went on to win. So I think the next time you play this Maroxi structure and uh, you get this kind of, of position where black is trying to uh, strengthen his control of the door scores, uh, please Just remember second. Ulf Anderson's idea. Rook c2, rook d2 and simply uh, eliminate that knight on d4. I think this was a very nice concept by my famous counterman, Ulf Anderson. Okay. Let's move on. Another aspect. Oh, now we have the famous game. Yeah, this is, I think, Ulf Anderson's most famous game. Uh, he was able to win against Anatoly Karpo. Maybe you saw the other day when uh, Yesipenko won against Carlson. That's more or less what happened here. Karpo oh. was extremely powerful in those years, 1975. It was very difficult for anybody to, to beat him. But actually, Anderson managed in this game. And people are already sending me the right, the right move for black here. So I won't even ask you for this one. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, the interesting so thing about this game is that Anderson uh, actually entered the kind of position where Karpo was very strong, uh, kind of hedgehog position. Uh, Karpo was a phenomenal player with a space advantage. But in this game, actually, uh, he, he ended up losing. So. 
Yeah, Owl's yeah. Hedgehog was too good. Yeah, okay, Orian, you're spamming here in the chat, so <laughs> I will uh, let you share with everybody the move that you have found here. Orian Gutla, what should D5? You start D5. with D5 to open up the center. Sure. sure. You won't get that pawn back, right? The pawn is now lost. So how would you follow up, Arian? What what was the big point behind the? Yeah, I will unmute you. Don't. It's it's rook takes e three. Yeah, it will come later. Uh, be patient, be patient. We will play that later. But now after d five, there is d6. one black piece exactly who becomes very happy. That's the bishop. Bishop d six. We're now attacking the pawn on h two. And Carpo played here knight f one. And now there is your move, uh, Arian. Now. Yeah. Anderson duly played. Rook takes e3. So he sacrificed a pawn, I... and now he sacrifices the exchange, right? Yeah. And if you would be playing white here, Aryan, how would you take on e3? Do you prefer with a queen or with a knight? Queen, big time. <laughs> queen, big time. Okay, but uh, Karpov is not, uh, he's not agreeing with you. He actually took with a knight here. So you would take with a queen because you would like to give back the material, right? Yeah. You don't uh, worry about black taking the the exchange, getting back yeah. the exchange. And this is what, what Ulf himself said about this game, that White should have uh, given back the exchange. And uh, yeah, this is how the game could have continued. Here we could play b5. This makes sense, trying to play knight b6 and, and pick up that pawn. And uh, well, White can fight for an advantage, but Black is rather solid also. But in the game, after rook takes e3, Karpov took with the knight. Yeah, how do you continue, Arian? Of course. Take on h2. It's time to take on h2. And again, it's interesting here to see the different styles of these two players. Because uh, in the game, Karpov here played simply knight f1, trying to keep that extra exchange, which he actually succeeded in doing. And Ulf said that Karpov was obsessed with material here. He should have tried to give back the exchange. And one way to do it would have been knight f5. So that after bishop f4, let's say, white could play something like knight e7 and knight c6. In this way, uh, okay, black gets his exchange back, oh, but uh, there is not so much attack for him anymore. So if takes, for example, uh, takes on c1, we would have this kind of position where, yeah, I think it's roughly equal here. Uh, white has a pass pawn, but black is active. Uh, I think black is, black is okay, but also white is okay. In the game, however, Karpo wanted to keep his extra exchange. And look what happened here. Bishop f4, rook c2. And now the typical hedgehog move, b5. This is very important for several reasons. Okay, we will save this pawn, but also we will prepare to play at some point uh, knight b6. Might be coming up here. Well, it actually happened here. Knight bishop d3, knight b6. And again, when Ulf looked at this game, he said that white should have played here d6. And this is a very clever move because in this way, white opens up the d-file so that he can later on swap pieces, which will, of course, uh, weaken the black attack. But, yeah, I mean, black could take with the rook, perhaps. And we could play something like, I don't know, knight e2, uh, improve the queen and, and look for exchanges, right? Exchange pieces with white makes a lot of sense here because black is attacking. But Karpov didn't want to... Uh, lose that pawn. He kept that pawn. He played here bishop e4. And this is already a rather important mistake. So hmm. at this point, black should try to bring more pieces to the attack. And he played here knight c4. As you can see, most of his pieces are very strong now. And the knight becomes a very good square on d6. You remember from the Petrosian session that the blockade is a very important uh, concept in, in position like this. Like this. Again, uh, Ulf proposes that White should have played here d6, trying to swap off pieces. But okay, that didn't cross Karpov's mind. He played a4 here, uh, trying to get some counterplay on the queen side. And here, Black played a nice move, rook e8. And as you can see, in this way, Black is mobilizing the rook to the attack. So very uncomfortable for for White. Uh, let's see very quickly what happened here. This game is very famous. Bishop e5 installing the threat of taking on b2. In this way, uh, the pawn on b5 would become pass pawn. Queen c5 and knight d6. Kind of Petrosian style 
Okay. Very nice. difficult position for white. This is a long game. We won't look at all of it. Let's just say that black got the better of it here. Bishop d6 so that the rook will come to e5. You can see that different pieces in black's camp can take up the locating task here. g3, queen e8, putting pressure on the central pawns after rook d e1, bishop b7. The bishop is going to c8. Uh, with Anderson's onwards, black already has a decisive positional advantage. Interesting, no? Because he's still the exchange down, some will say. But uh, his pieces are extremely active and he has a nice blockade in the center. So total nightmare for white here. Okay, very quickly, the black pieces join the attack. And uh, yeah, later on here, the, com the comment say that queen e7 was perhaps even stronger here in order to play queen f6 but also it's it's good what anderson played he just took on d2 and then knight takes c4 he got back the exchange he's a pawn up now and he went on to win so i just felt that i had to show you this classical game very important game uh, anatoly karpov was clearly the world's best player back in those years and it was very impressive to beat him with the black pieces and in his favorite kind of position with Space advantage. Yeah, D5. Game. As you sick can see game. here, Anderson is ready to give away a pawn. One of the he best even games gives of all time, away the exchange later on. So, a lot of Hedgehog players, they found inspiration in this game. Uh, very important to know this stuff if you play the Hedgehog. Okay, let's see a few more things about Ulf in the middle game. King safety. That's an important part for, hmm. for uh, I like this Ulf position. Anderson. How do you think that White secured his king here? I will just give you one minute because you don't have to calculate anything. One, one minute, try to find the best defensive idea for White. Hmm. One minute, uh-oh. One minute, guys, okay. Well, knight a4 is the thematic move. Knight a4, knight c5. Queen d4. You play in the dark squares here. Knight c uh, Please, C5 no spamming good. in the chat. Okay, uh, Orian, you don't let me read comments from other people. <laughs> yeah. Knight e2 is possible, but knight, knight a4 is really the, the typical idea here. Knight a4, queen d4, knight c5. Yeah, bishop d4 possible too. I, I like queen d4, like just to use the queen more actively, put pressure on the diagonal, open up rook fd1, hit a7. But bishop d4 can be played too. Queen can go to b2 then. Like knight a4, bishop d4, queen d2, queen b2. Also very possible. Okay, a lot of people found the right solution. One of the fastest one was Kirk Gasarian. So please share with us, Kirk, how to continue here with the white piece. Uh, knight e2 is the correct move for white. Opening up the bishop on b2 follow, and white can play knight g3 to block uh, black's bishop from attacking h2. So now knight g4 ideas aren't very useful for black. By the way, what would you play here after knight g4? This wasn't played in the game, but I looked oh, at this. Uh, which move do you like for white here? <laughs> I would play uh, knight g3 because if I play h3, there's knight h2. Exactly. And... If you play knight g3, I would play queen h4. I was looking at this variation. Uh, Three. Not so clear, maybe. Or what do you think? What about h3? Also, there was knight f4 that... too, instead of knight g3. Knight f4 also might be a good so, move. Sorry, just to finish off here. I could take on e3, perhaps, in this case. What about knight takes f5? But now you cannot take on f5 due to the mate, right? No, no, so, no, I mean, no, 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 no. When after h3, knight takes e3. Ah, you want to take on f5. I will take and you play. I understand you play bishop g4 here, something like that. Yes. Yeah, maybe you could play play like that. Also, perhaps I could consider to take on f2 instead. Maybe that's oh, even stronger. Take on f2, yeah. But then because if you take on f5, I'll three. take on d1. I think I'm a pawn up here, right? Yeah, knight takes f2 would be good. So instead of knight g3, knight f4 maybe is better. Aha, maybe knight, knight f4. I understand you. Yeah, in this way... Yeah. Uh, I also see no the problems would... with g3 either. Also, I see no problems with g3. That's, that's, what, that's what, what my point. I think, because I asked myself what would Ulf play here with white, and I think he would actually settle for g3. And I think one interesting idea here is that if black plays knight e5, I mean, the immediate move for us, most of us, would be to play bishop g2. 
But I think, uh, Kurt, that uh, White would play something else here. What would you play with White in order to keep uh, com complete uh, security? <laughs> well, maybe we don't agree on this. Let's see. Maybe what do you think is White's? Four? Please. I'll play um, bishop takes e5. Aha, exactly. That, that's what I thought. Bishop takes e5. And I remember this pattern wow. from the Sicilian with black. Sometimes you swap the bishop, uh, your fianchetto bishop. And in this and way, I black has no attack anymore. Exactly. Aha, we can go knight e4. Exactly. And you could even play and b4. b4. Too. That... And b4, exactly. Ah, okay, we understand each other perfectly. That's what I was looking at when I looked at this game. So b4, we prevent c5. And, and I mean, maybe white doesn't have a big advantage here, but his king is completely safe. And that's what this is about. Um, king safety. Okay, Kirk, let's see here. 92 in the game, black played 94. And I'm sure that your next move here was knight g3. g3. Correct, yes. Knight exactly. G3. Knight g3. That's how the game went. And now black took on g3 and white maybe took queen back. Queen h4 was a better try, by the way. Was queen h4 a trickier try? Or maybe but I can take on g7 then. Also, now I can yeah, take on g7. Yeah, you can take because of knight f5, yeah. Right. But also maybe even here, rook e6. Aha, going for for an attack here. Yeah, it's, maybe. What, probably not the what most should white style. play here? Queen takes d5? I was thinking of Interesting. actually... Uh, Interesting yeah, actually, yeah, option here. I just said might be good, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. but, well, you're going to make me there. Oh, Kostya says queen takes d5. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> the, Kostya's tactical vision. Wow, that's really impressive. If I play rook h6, Kostya. Oh, oh uh, that's a very stupid comment. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Kostya. Queen takes d5, Wait, it's a killer. What if because queen if I take... Six. What if rook just, six? just so that everybody understands Kostya's yeah. idea. Now, finally, we can pick up the bishop with check. That's right. So, I, I guess, Kirk, that's the answer here. What if yeah, queen takes d5. Wait, uh, does rook g6 fail? Ah, yes, queen takes d5. Oh, no, because five. I can just pick up your bishop with the queen then, right? Yep, so queen takes this does... Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't work. Uh, nice, nice uh, idea. Uh, queen takes d5. That's really impressive. Uh huh. So I guess Wait, what if there's white bishop he played? G3, by the way. What if after queen takes d5, bishop takes g3? I guess then we take with tempo, maybe it also works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we is... just uh, take and we uh, we hit the queen. Yes, yeah, that no no issues. I think white is, is fine here. Or should we take with other pawn? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Maybe this yeah, is maybe... better so that we, ha we have the f file open. Well, who knows? Uh-huh. Interesting. Okay, we have some other comments here. No, but bishop f8, not king g7. Okay, let, let's see again Kostya's variation here. Pawn takes, but, but I think white uh, wins anyway, right? I can just take and... Yeah, uh, too much material. I will end up... I didn't calculate all this. With an uh, extra piece. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, back to business here. Interesting variation by Kirk here, queen h4. Very interesting. And it seems that actually white can take this pawn uh, due to this nice tactical trick pointed <laughs> out by Kosta. Yeah, Kostya, queen takes d5. Anyway, in the game, knight takes d3, h takes, and here I think black wanted to push c5. That explains why he played bishop e4. And here we have a nice continuation by Ulf. Uh, Ulf notices that this rook doesn't play, so simply queen e2. Okay, Kirk, how to take on f3 now? With the queen or with the pawn? Well, I initially thought I would question. take with the pawn. I would take with the pawn, of course. So king g2, yes, and then rook h1. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened in the game. This is a very nice pawn structure, by the way. If you, if you play the Karokan, you come across this sometimes with reversed colors. Uh, yes. So, in the game, I think black should have played c5, and after rook d1, something like d4. Well, who knows what will happen here, but at least black is fairly active. In the game, black simply played bishop e5. And this is a positional mistake, and it's even worse to play it against somebody like Ulf Anderson, because now the weakness of the hanging pawns will become more serious. He simply took here. I think, Kirk, you have no problem finding White's next move, right? F4 or King G2? Uh, King G2, I would say. Or F4. Actually, okay. both... Actually he, did, he, he didn't do, do neither of those. He oh, played in the, the Ru Rubinstein yeah. style here. Rook yeah, he simply five. played Rook C5 Rook first. Rook C5. And after Queen D7, he noticed that uh, there was coming up some no problems here. Then he played F4. F4, oh, F4. Yes. And now, yeah, the rook has to go back. I guess the rook should have gone to E8. Would have been, E6 would have been better. Anyway, uh, the rest of the game, it's it's not so interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but uh, not for this subject of king safety. Uh, white was just much better here, and uh, black had a bad uh, moment here. He lost the pawn. Uh, he couldn't protect the pawn anymore. 
uh, if rook e6, white wins a pawn here, right? Uh, Kirk, we win a pawn here. Take on d5? Uh, just white rook takes d5, right? Yes, take rook takes d5. Maybe black missed this detail in the, Get right. in the, in the game. So, okay. summing up, what happened here is that Ulf noticed that the bishops were rather menacing against his king, and for this reason, he hurried to play knight e2. Very quickly, knight e2, bring the knight to g3 in order to secure the king. Okay. One last example about king safety then. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kirk. One last example about king safety. You're playing with the uh, black pieces here. We don't <laughs> have much time, so very quickly, I will just ask you for black's best move here. Funny move, some would say. Let's see if you can find it. I will only give you one minute. Black to play and save himself, uh, defend uh, successfully against the white attack. I would love to trade queens, like queen a5, queen c5. e5, very possible, hitting the g5 pawn. e5 is a cool trick. e5, maybe white backs up, queen e3 though. Yeah, e5, queen e3, and then knight will try to jump to d5. But that's a nice trick. Knight g7. Definitely a move. Not sure what's happening there. But my, my instinct is to do something immediate. I like this queen a5 because I, I would love to trade queens. But I'm wondering maybe white goes f6 or something. Okay, time's up. Tough Black one. is in some oh, trouble here. Taking... No Fianchetto bishop anymore. White has a clear so space advantage. Also, we have to be careful here. Knight e5 might be coming up. Uh, f6 at Feels some very, moment. Uh, very loose. But there is a very strong way for Black to counter all this. And Asish Panda found it. So, Asish, please share with us what to play with Black here. Oh, I said like rook c5. And it's like... Aha. Uh -huh. And wow. he kind of like never pushes f pawn since there's rook g5. And exactly. We are now preventing the f6 move. And where is this rook heading, Asis? Where will this rook go? Uh, e5. <laughs> exactly. The rook is going to oh, e5. Man. If That's white crazy. plays knight e5, just like Asis is saying, we have some pressure along the fifth rank, so we can play e6 here without any big issues. If pawn yeah, now e6 knight comes with second, tempo, I mean, so nice. we can take. Take, take. And this is a funny position. Normally, we, we would be pretty scared by a pawn on f6, but actually, black has everything under control here. We can play simply bishop yeah. c6. Please notice that the rook is not going to be trapped. It can always settle on e5. And now also the pawn on f6 is becoming a weakness. So black has no real troubles here in this position. Pawn takes, pawn takes perhaps. And uh, actually the white, it's white king which is most exposed here, rook g5 coming up. So uh, this is not good for white. Yeah, in the game he played brilliant. bishop d 3 And here we have uh, assist move, rook e5. Fantastic uh, blockading concept. Uh, please notice that white has no pieces which can uh, get rid of that rook. Uh, he's, he has no dark squared bishop and the knight is far away from the e5 square. And after rook f2, preparing to double the rooks, Anderson even took uh, active measures now. He played f6. Very nice. <laughs> uh, not so easy for white anymore. Yeah. He took on f6, knight takes, and slowly the black pieces uh, starting to, to wake King up here. Knight e8. Uh, I mean, bishop e8, clever move, protecting the pawn on g6 after knight d5. Black didn't want to take on d5 because after that, e takes d5 and this bishop becomes strong again. So Anderson simply played here king h8, getting rid of the pin along the g5. There followed rook f1 and simply bishop f7. Now, why should be careful? Because black might be thinking about at some moment take on d5, which will give him basically a good knight versus a bad bishop. So in the game, there followed knight takes, pawn takes, bishop c2, queen is 7 rook d2, rook d8. And black had no particular problems here. Uh, I would even say that black is slightly better here because his bishop is, well, it's not very active right now, but in the long run, it's a stronger bishop than, than the white yeah, bishop. He won the game. Why not e5 in the first move? We have a comment here from Austin Tang. Well, why didn't Ulf play e5? I guess he didn't like the looks of that weak pawn on, on d6, right? Yeah. I'm not an expert in this 
particular structure. Okay, we have another. I would uh, go queen e3. As There's you no says, queen b6. Queen e3 is stronger. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Aha, uh, maybe the queen could go, could go to h4 later on with some attack. What was wrong with knight g7? Okay, let's look at another candidate move. Knight g7. Why didn't he play knight g7? Well, perhaps he didn't like f6. Is that so? Knight e6 is what you would like to play. Queen e3, perhaps. Knight e5 coming up. Again, I'm not a specialist on this structure, but I don't really like it, uh, honestly. Oh, you want to take on f6. Okay. You want to take on f6? Okay, I will take back. But now also your pawn is weak on b6. And, uh, and notice that one one day I might be able to bring a knight to e7. So I think it's better what uh, Anderson played here. Rook c5, very interesting blockading concept. The rook is coming to e5 and black has no problems anymore. It's time for us to move on with end games now. We will have to move on to end games, uh, although I was going to show some other stuff here, but I think time won't let us uh, look at those games, unfortunately. That's even my game. You can see here my game when I lost <laughs> game. against Ulf Andersson back in 1994. Oh, how about uh, that? So <laughs> let's move on to the end games. Here we have a game where Ulf is just 20 years old and he is able to beat no one less than Viktor Korsnoy in this end game. So please let me know how should black continue here. Uh, I think we'll have to stick to one minute. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. That's very little time, but in order to uh, to be able to show some end games of Ulf Anderson, black to play, try to find his best choice here. Okay, first on ninety four is kind of interesting because if white takes e four, d e four, pawns on the queen side are going to be weak. B three is hanging. B four, we go bishop. B3, A5, take, take, and king starts walking in. So knight E4, if I plays knight F3 or something, then... Actually, I don't know. Maybe we push D4. I'm kind of having second thoughts. D4 takes knight F5? Try to take on d4. a5? a5 is possible. I'm worried that white's next move is going to be knight f3, knight d4. And if white gets that, then white Okay, is time's worse. up. As you I can see, d4. we have a typical isolated queen spawn structure. Takes and white is dying to bring a knight to d4, you know, to block yeah. that pawn and leave black with a back, black, bad bishop. But that never happened in the game. Uh, Brian Tay found a very good move for Black here. Uh, please let us know, Brian. So here, play d4. First of all, it isolates the pawn. Uh huh. Nice. He takes d4, knight f5, it attacks the pawn. If he doesn't exactly. take f3, then he just loses and Black is more active. So knight f3, and then bishop d5. Uh -huh. Or you can take the pawn, I guess. I and it. now Black would have. Uh, Pawn majority on the queen side as well, right? Yes. So this this looks bad for for white. Uh, in the game he played e4, and now we have a difficult move here with black. But maybe you you can find it. Or well, I will give you one minute to everybody to to see if you can find a uh, next very important move in this game. Maybe now a one minute black's best move, please. Now a5 makes a lot of sense. Fixing the b3 pawn is a weakness. A5, then knight b7, knight c5. I think, I think that's what we have to do. a5, knight b7, knight c5, hitting b3, hitting e4. And then our king is a little bit closer too. Our king wants to walk like king d7, king d6. So that would be my guess, this move a5. But we'll see, guys. We'll see. I feel like we're doing pretty good today. I like this Ulf Anderson. I feel like I can <laughs> guess a lot of his moves. Okay, time's up. We had very few people who found the right move. I mean, apart from Ulf Anderson. One <laughs> of them was uh, Crystal Gu. So, Crystal, please share with us Black's best move. Um, Black's best move was F5. F5. 
Aha, very nice. What is that good for? Why do we play f5 here? Wow. Okay, Crystal already uh, muted. <laughs> okay, so I mean, the point is that when we have a passed pawn, it's important to clear out some space for, for our pieces. And I guess what Crystal looked at was e5. Okay, Crystal, you're on again. How were you preparing to meet e5? You have a very strong move here, right? An a4 maybe? Um, yeah, um, so after e5, I don't know if I'm right, but I would go like knight to um, e4. Exactly, very nice. We're trading the f pawn for the b pawn. That's good business for black here. So if, if take, no, I'm sorry, we're not trading anything. That, that's a bad comment from, from me. Now we have terrific pass pawns. Yeah, of course. So we're undermining the pawn on on b3 nice. well, and this is not easy for for white i thought about knight c4 but uh, what would you play here crystal just take it take a king e7 you're almost winning a pawn i guess okay never mind nice knight c5. c5 i think is coming up and it's not so easy for white to to defend in this in this position the pawns are weak and also the black deep pawn is mobile nice when i saw this example i thought about the importance of of clearing space now when you have a passed pawn and just very quickly if you look at this theoretical position from the sicilian you can actually see that uh, white also in this position uh, likes to play f4 this is the theoretical move here yeah we, it's not an anderson game by the oh, way it's just time some off. recent game <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's the same idea we're trying to help our passed pawn so this this is an interesting variation if you play the sicilian uh, anyway back to oh, ulf's five. game d4 like Crystal explained, very important move. If pawn takes, we have knight f5. In the game, there was e4, and we should hurry to play f5. Some people were saying here, a5. Yeah, I thought yeah. about this myself. This looks like a schoolbook a5. move. You're fixing the pawns Textbook. on the right color, so to speak. Yeah. However, it, this would allow white to take some space with f4, and then perhaps bring the king. I still like this for black. One idea would be to bring the king to, to, the, to the queen side, right? To bring in the king looks promising for black yeah anyway f5 is, is also strong okay uh of course <laughs> now he took on f5 there was bishop takes f5 and now bishop g2 yeah the bishop should be improved and also white's trying to bring in the king and here we have the famous concept of active king in the end game king e6 and it appears to me that Korsnoy wanted to play knight f3 here but suddenly he noticed that Black was going to play the brave and very strong move, King d5. Oh, no matter, wow. uh, white can give different uh, discover checks here, but none of them is really Doesn't dangerous matter. for King is for coming black. to c5. Uh, he will just move on the king and attack yeah. the pawns on d3, a4. That's nice. Very important uh, concept, active king. So in the game, Korsnoi played first bishop a8, and this looks like a mistake. I think the best move here was f4 in order to bring the king. He played here bishop a8. By the way, Korsnoi was a fantastic endgame player as well, but in this game, he was not able to save it. Bishop c2, uh, tying the knight to the defense of the pawn. And after knight f3, yeah, this is decisive mistake in this game. Uh, of course, black simply uh, pushed the pawn. Mm -hmm. And after king f1, white still had some hopes of bringing in the king. And now I will ask you for black's best move here. So one minute, please let me know. How should black continue in this Knight position? d4 is a problem, so we can't take on b3. Hint, think about the future of your king. So I'm thinking knight f5, so we can cover the d4 square and then start walking. King d6, king c5, king b4. So I would go knight f5. I mean, you're not forced to move your king, right? Just think about your king, okay? <laughs> Aha, very nice. G4, you know, whatever, we move the knight somewhere. And then king is anyway trying to go d6, king c5. At least that's, that's my thought. Okay, time's up. Arian Gutla found this one. Okay, you're on, Arian. So here you start with bishop d1. 
Aha. Because his knight is blocking in most of the major entry squares. So exactly. you have to get rid of that knight if you can. So uh -huh. probably knight d4. Yeah, that's how the game went. Okay, please continue, Arian. Then king e5. Aha. White gave check here. I think Kosnoi was uh, thinking that maybe he could get a draw here, but Ulf didn't want to draw. He played here king f6. And now, as you can see, if knight d4, what were you planning here, Arian, with the black pieces? Well, there are two moves which would let you win here. Maybe d2. You can just pick one of them. Knight to f5. Yeah, that's one of them. That's that's an excellent choice because you will pick up the pawn on b3. But actually, you can also push the d pawn. And how on earth should White uh, react here? Hopeless for White. I don't know. Because the bishop is threatening to to move away, so he would have to play, I guess, knight f3. And uh, I guess Black would just net a pawn here and should be winning. Well, something very similar happened in the game. White played king e1, and uh, Ulf just took the pawn, and then. Uh, he went on to win here with, a, with an extra pawn. So I think this is a very nice uh, first example of Ulf Andersson's fantastic endgame play. Uh, he had this position where, it, at first sight, you might think that white is better. He's very close to achieving a blockade on the dark squares. However, by the very strong move, d4, actually black turned the tables here and uh, at, obtained a better nice, end. Man. If pawn takes, uh, we had this idea with knight f5 taking back the pawn with a better position and if e4 very important move f5 and notice that at this point uh, anderson wasn't even a grandmaster and he was only about 20 years old wow. and he managed to beat Korsnoi. it's like the other day uh, another very strong uh, swedish chess player nils Kandelius. he was able to beat uh Vachiel lagrav in the tournament in holland and it's a similar situation uh, very good day for Swedish chess. NBL, uh, of course not. <laughs> always happy when uh, all players manage to beat one of the world's best players, like in this case, Viktor Korsnoi. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, this is a nice example. One of Ulf's main, uh, how can you say, uh, rivals at this point, Bent Larsen, another great player from the Nordic countries. Here we have a Bishop versus knight endgame, one of Ulf's favorites. He was very strong with a knight in, in the endgame. And uh, that's what this endgame is about. It's equal material, but as you can see, black has a kind of bad bishop and also he has double pawn. So white should have a clear advantage here. However, we only have one way in which we can win here. Only one plan will let white win this game. So. One minute, I think it's too little. So two minutes I will give you here. Try to come up with White's winning plan. Hint, use the knight in a very intelligent way. Hmm. Well, one idea is just to put the king on g3 here, put the knight on d4. And try to make progress this way, but like knight d4, bishop d7, king g3, black plays bishop c8, then maybe knight c6, we force black to push a6. I mean, I love white's position there. I would, I would take that all day. Knight b4 or something, try to get the knight to d5, hit the f6 pawn. As soon as black's king has to move off of h5, <clears throat> then we start... We start advancing like h4, king h4, and so on. So, king g3 would be my or, or knight d4 first, then king g3. I'm not sure. Sounds like it does make a difference, but I'm not sure what it would be. Knight d4, bishop d7, king g3, bishop c8, knight c6, a6, knight e7, bishop e6, knight c6, bishop d7, knight d4, bishop c8. We have h4 somewhere if we need to gain a tempo.
Okay, time's up. I know two minutes is very little time for <laughs> one, such yeah. a difficult task. Mm -hmm. However, Aradia Panda, I think, uh, has found the right idea. Panda? So, Aradia, please share with us how to continue with white here. Yes, like my first move was um, knight d4. Uh huh. I must play bishop d7, right? To keep track of this pawn. And what's next? Yeah, now we go like, I was looking at a6, but I realized that like king g3 is better. Aha, uh -huh. I think if a6, perhaps I could consider also a move like, I don't know, waiting move? Is that possible? Well, it's, it's not completely clear. Let's see what, what you're saying here. King g3, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't let me enter with the king. And uh, yeah, I will play, let's say, king g6, just waiting. And yeah. how do you continue? Yeah, now I was like thinking like h4 or like king h4, but I saw h4. But king h4. Sorry. Yeah, I saw... I mean, you king h4, I think you don't uh, progress too much, do you? Yeah, this was my problem. So I played h4 because we're just gonna, like, kind of like... Like, he's in Zugzwang, basically. Except well, he... I, I would say he, he's not in Zugzwang yet, but uh, at this point, you have a very strong plan here. Uh, you would like to bring your king to the opposite flank, I think. But you can't do it because the black king is too active, so... Uh, what's the mechanism in order to uh, leave the black king restricted here? Yeah, well, I didn't really three. like look at this, but now I think <laughs> I'm gonna go like king h3, knight e2, knight g3. Bravo! That's that's it. That's it. Ulf Anderson that's also nice. found this plan at the board. King h3, king g6, and what move were you saying, um, Aradia? Uh, knight e2. Exactly. That's a fantastic move. Knight e2. That knight, uh, I mean, it's natural for us to look how to use this knight on the on the queen side, how can we create threats and so on. But actually the right place for this knight is on g3. Now we put it on g3 and black will never be able to enter on the king side with his king. And at the same time, the knight is tying at least one black piece to the defense of the f5 pawn. So after king f7, of course, Ulf didn't take the pawn. That would be a dreadful mistake. Uh, he would then be tied up, uh, I mean... Wait, doesn't this still work with h5? But oh, I think yeah. you will run out of moves, won't you? I think this, this looks bad for, for black, for white. So, uh, in the game, don't take that pawn, just uh, use the king, and that's what happened. Now we just move over the king. Yeah, black's king had to move over as well, because else the white king will enter, right? But at some point, somebody must take care of the pawn, and that's the bishop in this case. But as we can see here, White can play on both flanks. He's ready to play king b4. And if king c5, what would you play now, Radia? How to finish off black here? Um, well, h5, h6, h5. h5. Sure, of course. Now it's time to, to play on the king side again because the black king has, has moved away. So now we go h5, exactly. And as you know, in the endgame, the knights Push should move knight around h5. a lot. So what would be white's next move, Radia? Um, well, like at first I see like h6 and knight h5. Aha, uh -huh. you could play h6, you're right. Uh, but he didn't play like this. Why is that? Good question. Maybe he thought that the king would go back. Is that so? Potter. Yeah, but... He didn't like that. But then you can perhaps... Yeah, I guess you're right. He could play like that. In the game, however, he kept the pawn on h5 and he just moved the knight over. And uh, I think this was an easier, easier way to win. And then he just brought in the knight, and finally Black had to give oh, up the bishop. Wow, yeah, yeah, it's easy to win now. Yeah, okay, okay that's pretty good too, I guess. Finished. Yeah, Alpha is good, and guys. Interestingly enough, when I put this position to the engine, it gives me about equality. It, it doesn't find immediately the right way to go. It needs at least 30 seconds, at least on my computer, to find the right way for white here. Wow. Very interesting way to play. Knight e4, in order to bring the knight later on to g3. This is where the knight belongs in this endgame. So that in this way, we can prevent the ent entrance of the black king. A kind of barrier. This is what I call a barrier. We don't let the knight, the king in. And then we have free hands with the king. We can go over to the other flank. So extremely useful method uh, to use in your games. Okay, excellent work, work Aradia. Let's continue. And this is another endgame I like very much. I will give you two minutes here. Try to find white's best move here. And I'm afraid that only one move will 
suffice to win the game. We already have an advantage, of course, <laughs> with clear. the outside pass to pawn. If there were no bishops on the board, white would win rather easily, I guess. But there are bishops on the board, so uh, that complicates our task. Two minutes, try to find a very precise move by white, which secured the win here. Okay, so here we have this outside passer. We can push a5, king e8, a6, king d7, bishop a3, bishop a7, bishop f8. That's pretty annoying. A5, king e8, a6, king d7. Mm, e4, also a big idea here. e4, king e2, trying to play bishop e3. Like e4 takes, king e2. Takes, king takes f3, king e8. Okay, time's up. This is a very clear. tough one because we have several tempting choices e4 here. Let me tell you in the first place uh, what I looked at. Uh, I thought that perhaps the right move to play here was e4. This looks very logical. Bring the king to d3, swap the bishops, and then our outside pass pawn should yeah. do the job. However, black can play here in an interesting way. He should start with the move h5. Once you see this move, you will understand which is white's best move, right? Pawn takes, pawn takes. Let's continue with this plan. If we play bishop e3 here, I think black might consider to play d4 and bring his king to d5. So perhaps first king d3, king d6. And if white plays, let's say, bishop e3, we could play bishop e4. As I was saying to you, if there are bishops on the board, black still has a fair chance of saving this idea. Uh -huh. So I, I couldn't really find a way to win this with the white pieces. Bishop e2 perhaps, and push the king, the pawn, the king goes there. I even looked at this position. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, looked like white is on the verge of winning, but not so easy because uh, the bishop will try to avoid the entrance of, of the white king. There is a much better move. And uh, Kirk Gazarian found this one. So Kirk, please share with us what you have found here. Uh, the white's best move is g4 because it's very important to keep uh, black's pawns fixed on the dark squares in this opposite in the same colored bishop ending. Uh, and black would like to stop that by playing h5 first, followed by g6, putting his pawns on the opposite g4. color as his bishop. So once we play g4, we can soon play h4, h5, fixing the pawn on g7, and then we can improve our king's position and play bishop b2, uh, targeting the pawn on g7. And meanwhile, black's tied up on the uh, g7 pawn, we can distract him with the uh, outside pass pawn on a4. And so, let's see if... Uh, you're right, that's a very good analysis. And I think Ulf Anderson was thinking in the same terms as you. Let's see, Kirk, if you can find the next moves here. Well, you already said the next move, right? h4. We're preparing to, to fix with h5. However, here he didn't play h5 straight away. I guess he wanted to improve his king first. So here comes the king. And uh, it's not easy for black to do anything. Please notice that h5 is not possible, g takes. And g6 is also impossible due to bishop takes. So basically, black cannot improve his pawns. Of course, if black oh. would play at any moment bishop f8, 
White would hurry to play h5, of course, so that, well, it, well, maybe it doesn't matter really, because he could also wait for black to play g6 and then play h5. Anyway, the important thing is that the pawn on h6 doesn't count to h5. Anyway, let's see what happens. Also, Bishop e4. also another thing is, sometimes when the pawn is on h5 and you play g6 and your bishop's on f8, sometimes not only can I ignore it with uh, by doing nothing in that position, uh, also g5 could yeah, work. Th yeah, I think so. Yes. Yes, uh, I, I understand. You can play some move here, and after g6, you can play h5, and now you're tying the black bishop to the, h, to the h6 pawn. Exactly. Yeah, you're completely, you're completely right. Let's see very quickly what happened here in the game. Bishop e4, now he fixed the pawns, and, uh, well, bishop b2 is coming up, so finally black had to play here f6, which he didn't, which he didn't want to play. And uh, what do you think, uh, Kirk, is now the winning maneuver here for white? Um. I'm thinking it's... The thing is that the, A3, the, the point is very weak on G7, right? Yeah, I'm thinking of so, uh, how I'm going to play this, how I'm going to uh, play the move order. I'm trying to think of Bishop B2 uh, followed by some G5 coming at some point. Oh, wow. Actually, you don't have to think uh, about uh, such complicated uh, ideas. But I can also just That's play a... right, F4, G5 without delay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You're right. Interesting also. Although, generally speaking, swapping pawns should make... Life easier for the defender, but uh, I think there is a better way to play here. Again, we were saying that if there were no bishops on the board, White would win comfortably, right? With the king before a five, bringing the king and so on. Yes, so, so actually, like would, play, yes. you could play bishop a three, but in the game, however, mm -hmm. I guess Wolf wanted to swap them a little higher up on the board, so he played here bishop d two, wow. yes. and the bishop is coming to to d four. Hmm. And this whole plan, please notice everybody that this wouldn't have made sense hadn't we played h4 h5 because black would simply move away the bishop but now since we already fixed the pawn on g7 we're ready to go bishop f8 and we're winning a very important pawn so for this reason this plan was so strong to fix a weakness on g7 so bishop e4 that followed king c6 black had to accept a, a pawn endgame but as you all know once we have an outside passed pawn that's usually bad news for the opponent uh, what would you play here kirk with white pieces E3 or King C3? I, I just want to uh, um, wait and out tempo. You all play King C3. Exactly. Exactly. Invite yeah. check and go back. Yes. King C3 was played. Yeah, inviting the check and then we just go back. That's the, the correct way to play here. Black is now left without waiting moves. King we are not forced out. to play A5. Uh, he has to move his king and that's what happened in the game. And here, usually in this kind of position, what we do is we try to uh, sack the pawn and then we move over the king, but in this but case... But here we just black... stalemate the king. We just stalemate exactly. the king. Exactly. You're completely right. Here it's much better for us to stalemate the king so as to avoid any counterplay. That's what happened in the game. Yeah, now Beliavsky already noticed what's <laughs> what's going on here. He's going to be stalemated. Well, almost. And eventually he will have to move the g pawn and then, yeah, white wins. So I think this is a very nice uh, example of the importance of fixing pawns in... Wow. Bishop uh, endgames, uh, endgames with bishops of the same color. Very genius. important move, g4. Well, Ulf was a true expert in this field, uh, looking at small details in the endgame, uh, noticing them, and taking taking them, uh, using them to his advantage. Ultra Let's see if zero. we can look at one last example then, because I think we're already slightly uh, beyond schedule. Yeah, this one, <laughs> should, should we look at this one? Oh, I think we should look at, have a look at, at the rook endgame as well. Yeah, let's have a look at this rook ending uh, played when Ulf was facing Bent Larsen in a match. And uh, I have noticed over the years, I played several times with Ulf Anderson, that very often he would win drawn endgames. And he would win them because obviously the opponents would make some mistake. And that's something that you can see also in the games of Magnus Carlsen, right? That's mm -hmm. the way that he often wins his games. Uh, Nobody can play in the perfect way. Sooner or later, opponents will make mistakes and uh, we should exploit them. And that's what happened here. Black has a holdable endgame. Uh, this rook endgame with the pawn down is still holdable. White's pawn structure is not ideal and the black rook is active. However, at this exact moment, Bent Larsen made a huge mistake. He could choose between two moves here with his rook. He could play rook f1, targeting the pawn on f2, and he could play rook h1. One of them is good and one of them is bad. Uh, I was going to ask you which one is the good one and which one is the bad one, but I think 
uh, we have too little time left. So let me just tell you that the right move here would have been rook f1, because in this way, we would have tied uh, at least one white piece to the defense of this pawn, let's say king e3, and then you could perhaps bother him with another check. So th this would be a good way to play with, with the black pieces here. If the black, if the white rook go, goes back also, uh, yeah, it gives black some time to, to improve his king, for example. In the game, however, uh, Larsen played here rook h1, which is a natural move because we're targeting a pawn which cannot be defended. However, this was a losing decision. And now I would like you to find White's best way to continue here. The only way to win the game. Okay, two minutes. Try to find the way that oh White can win this game. Here we go. Hmm. I mean, there's e5. e5 calls out, but takes, takes, rook takes h2. And then black pushes f h4. Doesn't seem so clear. The only idea I can find is this e5. I don't really see another move for white. Check king g7, rook e8, black goes king f6. Oh, maybe then f4? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we give check, king g7, we go rook e8, or maybe rook b7, king f6, and then f4. When f4 takes takes, we're threatening e5. Yeah, f4, exactly. If we go rook b7, though, black will go king back to f8. So we have to be mindful of that. So maybe we have to go rook b8, king g7, rook e8. So that there's no king f8 possibility. Then king f6, f4. And we have this threat of e5, which is super annoying. So our pawns start breaking through. Yeah, that looks interesting, for sure. That'll probably be my choice. We have 10 seconds left, so... <laughs> It's probably what I would go with. Yeah, rook b8, rook e8, king f6, f4. Okay, time's up. They say all rook end games are drawn, but uh, that's not quite true, is it? Very important to think about activity in any rook ending. Here some people were saying that we could trap the rook. I have to check this variation here. Uh, Zoe is saying that there is a way to trap the rook. King e3. Rook takes h2, rook b1. I can't believe that I'm going to lose that rook here. I don't think that will happen, right? I could play g4 at any moment. And I'm not losing my rook. I could play for h4 later on. Aryan says, actually, most rook endgames are won by either side. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you're right. Uh, and very often they are, they might be drawn, but due to mistakes, one side can win. And that's what happened here. So let's go back to the to the position of rook h1, and I think Crystal has the right solution here. So please, Crystal, share with us. What's your solution here for white? Um, I would go rook to v8 check. Okay, king g7. And then rook to e8. Aha, uh -huh. that's the key move here. White should attack this pawn, because once this pawn uh, gets, uh, gets away from the board, uh, we will have chances of creating a past pawn, right? Excellent. Okay, I will play here, uh, Crystal, uh, king f6. Well, what would you play? What was your idea here, Crystal? Or maybe you uh, didn't my, this far. My idea was to play f4. Nice. Exactly, very nice. f4, and now we're gonna go e5. Please notice everybody that if we had played f4 straight away, this is not the same thing. I mean, I, I can take and I can take on h2 and uh, yeah. Uh, when white plays e5, for example, black has no reason to take uh, on e5. Or well, maybe he can even take and try to give check on, on h4. But let's say white gives check first on b8, then, and then we play e5. My point is that in this kind of position, black has absolutely no reason to take on e5. He could play something else, let's say rook f2. And now white should be careful as well. So you're completely right, uh, Crystal. Uh, rook b8 check, and king g7, rook e8. 
targeting the pawn on e7. And now, if king f6, we're ready to go f4. And it's not easy to see how to save black here after e5 coming up. He could, of course, take and put the rook on e1. But then I guess white could just switch focus with his rook to, to h8. And black has difficulties with his pawn as well. And again, e5 is coming up. So in the game, and Larsen took on h2, trying to create counterplay with his with his h pawn. However, white has a space advantage here. Rook takes e7. This pawn is already dreaming of queening. And after rook takes f2, uh, what do you think is the uh, right move here, Crystal? What would you play now with the white pieces? Which move do you like the most here? Um, here I like e5. Aha, uh -huh, I also like e5. That's definitely the right move. If we play slowly, let's say rook to seven, well, black's gonna run with his pawn. It's, it's gonna be dangerous for mm -hmm. us. So you're right. e5, it's very logical, says uh, Aradia. Yeah, of course. Time is money in this endgame. Black, if he takes on e5, would you take with a rook or with a king, uh, Crystal? Rook takes. Well, you have 50% uh, chance here. Rookie. I'm sure you will find it. Um... Maybe with the, um, I don't know. I think maybe with the rook. Yeah, I think so too. That, that's the best way to take. Because in this way, you keep track of the black pawns and you're ready to run. And also you have the king cut off so the black king cannot come there. So with the rook. Aha, in the game, uh, black played h4 instead. White took that pawn. Now if pawn takes, as you can see, uh, this is very bad for black. Uh, the white pawn is much stronger here. Uh, although, please notice that if we we just run, this might actually look like, like the first position that we <laughs> looked at today. Uh, we would be left without checks. This would probably be avoided. However, we can fix this by, of course, simply playing rook e1. Here. So uh, that's, nice. that's a simple solution. In the game, Larsen played rook f4, which is the logical move in order to move away the white king from, from the pawns. However, after king e3, uh, he took on h4. Pawn takes, rook, h6. Yeah, one last question for Crystal here. Um, what would you play with white now? Please be careful because uh, this move is, is very important. Um, uh, I will give you a hint. Uh, Ulf Anderson was very anti-materialist, so he doesn't mind losing a pawn if, if he can get some other benefit. It no, doesn't matter if you lose Black can take as long uh, as you keep activity, rook right? King has two pawns. Yeah, maybe you can play rook e5, but the problem with rook e5 is that I would be able to bring in my king. So I think I, I would never lose this with, with black because the king is now approaching the, the d file. So don't let the king out, please. Me king. Aha. King okay, Aradia and Asis and Aryan found the right move. Yeah, exactly. We should play here king d4. It would be a huge mistake to play d7. This is a typical materialistic move, which would ruin all white's previous efforts. Black would play rook d6, and next move king f6, and he would make a draw. Right. So, uh, king h4, what does it matter that we lose one d pawn when we have two left, right? Rook takes d6 and king c5. And white has a worse structure, but this doesn't matter really, because the pawn is so advanced. And also, as you can see, the king cannot come any closer. The rest is very easy for Ulf. Simply approach the king and continue to push the pawn. G4, rook e3, so that the pawn cannot advance anymore. We can already see that black is going to sacrifice at some moment. Rook takes pawn. Uh, this is what happened in the game. Rook e8. Uh, anyone, why is it so important to put the rook on e8? Why don't we continue simply with king c7? Why, why the mess with rook e8? You can just write in the chat. The chat. Well, king Save moves with the king. Yeah, you're right. In this way, uh, our king doesn't go to uh, uh, to the eighth rank, uh, and also it has to do with the rook, right? Because after rook takes the seven, king takes the seven, we can now use. Aha! Timothy says rook on the back rank to stop the pawns. Exactly. We should uh, hit him in the back, so to speak. This is the best place usually in this kind of rook versus pawn and games. Put your rook. Uh, behind the pawns. So that's why uh, Anderson is so eager to play here rook e8 in order to put his rook in the right angle. Rook takes, king takes, f4, 
king e6 and yeah the white king is already too close for black to have any chance of, of saving this uh, f3 was played in the game now we should simply prevent uh, the march of the f pawn and uh, one last detail here one last little uh, precise move from Anderson rook f4 in this way we are ready to play king f5 next move so I uh, know what what should black play here king h3 perhaps king f5 and yeah we will just uh, take the pawns and then we'll run with our pawn so summing up what happened here is that this was indeed a drawish endgame but black had to be very precise he should have put his rook on f1 in order to tie the white pieces to the defense of the f2 pawn he played rook h1 this was too optimistic and anderson very quickly understood what he should do here he should try to create a passed pawn on the d file and here black never had a chance anymore saving this game king f6 fails to the important move f4 preparing e5 please notice the importance of the active white king and uh, rook takes h2 as we already saw here the white passed pawn is much stronger here uh, the structure is not important anymore what's important here is the activity and uh, the white pawn is already very strong so i had a lot of other examples that uh, i would have really enjoyed to share with you but i think uh, it's already a bit late uh, thanks to everybody it has been very interesting to share these games of uh, one of the greatest players in chess history Ulf Anderson. and uh, i hope you will find some inspiration in these uh, examples can we have one more says evan i think i can't i think uh, they told me to stop so uh, you can take it from here, Kostya. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Evan. Thank you, Johan. That was a wonderful class. I really enjoyed it. Twitch loved it.